The aim of this evening is to begin a conversation. The Commission is here to listen as well as to share some of their knowledge and their experiences. This is your opportunity, though, to ask questions directly to the Commission, and we'll also be taking some of the questions that you asked when you pre-registered for this event. Ladies and gentlemen, it's now my pleasure to introduce Professor Tim Flannery, the Chief Climate Commissioner. Professor Flannery is one of Australia's leading writers on climate change, an internationally acclaimed scientist, explorer and conservationist, and of course, former Australian of the Year in 2007. He's held various academic positions, including Professor at the University of Adelaide, Director of the South Australian Museum in Adelaide, Principal Research Scientist at the Australian Museum and Visiting Chair in Australian Studies at Harvard University. Would you please welcome Professor Tim Flannery. Well, look, thank you all for being here this evening. Uh, I was here in Ipswich uh, around about two months ago and uh, got an insight into the conditions that many people of this city are facing. I, I don't think there's another community in Australia who are facing the stresses of the recent floods to such an extent as this one. So the fact that you're here tonight, we really, really appreciate. We know that there's many other calls on your time. I I'd like to just take a few minutes to explain what the Commission's about. The uh, Commission arose as a result of a promise at the last election by the Gillard government that they would set up a, a climate commission as an independent body, separate from government, but funded through government. Uh, we, uh, we don't answer to the minister, we're not responsible for government, but we have a very, a very uh, clear brief. And that brief is to engage with the Australian community, to uh, engage in discussions about three areas really, climate, the science of climate change, um, what's happening around the world in terms of climate policy, what other countries are doing, for example, and how that stacks up against what we're doing, and also the various options that we have uh, to choose from as Australians as we go about dealing with the climate problem. Now, we're, we're, not, uh, we're not going to be commenting on government policy or opposition policy as such, but because we are an apolitical independent body. And could I just say that personally, I value my independence tremendously. I've criticised John Howard and Kevin Rudd on their climate policies. Uh, it's not easy to do, I can tell you, but um, I, I value my independence a lot, so I'm not going to sell that out. And I think that the credibility of us as a commission really does rest uh, in large part on the fact that you can turn to us for credible, unbiased, apolitical advice. So uh, that's the sort of context we want to work within. The whole climate debate has become very heated. Um, in, in, well, recent years, really. Uh, and um, there is no doubt uh, quite a bit of irritation and anger out there about, about the topic. Um, and we respect that and understand it, but we would like to work, if we could, within a forum where we have the opportunity to think through some issues together. And um, unfortunately, anger and, and um, irritation sometimes get in the way of that topic. So I'd ask you um, to be as gentle with us as you can. Of course, you can say rough things, but... <laughs> But um, it'd be good if we could have a productive discussion and dialogue uh, from that. So thank you very much. I think we can, we can begin. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tim. Well, now it's over to you, ladies and gentlemen, for our question and answer session. We do have, as I mentioned, a number of pre-registered questions and we'll be seeking to answer a mix of those and, of course, a mixture from the floor. Um, if I could please ask, though, that your questions are focused and brief, maybe kept down to around 20 to 30 seconds, uh, so we can get through as many as possible this evening. And we hope also that you will reserve uh, your statements for another forum, as this is strictly an opportunity tonight for questions. We do have a number of roaming microphones this evening. If you'd like to ask a question, simply raise your hand and we'll get one across to you. If you could stand up and maybe give your name, followed by your question, and then please sit straight back down so that the people behind you can see. That would be wonderful, thank you. All right, let's get underway. Who has a question they'd like to start? My name is Kim Rathold. Look, I heard a really interesting report on the radio the other day that differentiated between the public debate and the science. on that. 
Yeah, well, thank, thanks for that question. I think it's a, a very perceptive one. And indeed, that is what the case is. Uh, the debate in the scientific community has gone way beyond what you see uh, in the public and particularly in the media. In fact, there's been a very big divergence over the last year or so. Uh, in the scientific community, there is no debate anymore about whether the Earth is warming. Uh, indeed, it is, and there's a lot of good strands of evidence to show that it is warming, uh, and that's not debated anymore. Uh, the second issue is what's causing that warming, uh, and we know that to a very, very high level of confidence, uh, that since the middle of the last century, at least, uh, the majority, main part of that warming uh, is due to the extra greenhouse gases in the atmosphere uh, that have been put up there by human activities. So that debate is over. If you go into the scientific literature, uh, you won't find it. It's been over for uh, a decade or two. Other areas of climate science, risks associated with uh, future change in the climate, there's still a lot of discussion and debate around some of those issues, and perhaps we'll get on to those uh, later this evening. Thank you very much, Will. I hope that answered your question, sir. Who has a question now that they'd like to ask one of the commissioners? The lady over there in the green. A oh, gentleman, sorry. My name is Malcolm Roberts, and I've yet to have my sex change operation, but that's OK, Lisa. And I need glasses, so I do apologise. <laughs> that's OK. Uh, just so long as no one says, will you please stand up? Um, Will, I take um, issue with your comment about the science has moved on. During the last few years, I've read thousands of pages of scientific literature. And um, clearly, the IPCC has presented us with a lot of corruption, not real world science. So my question to you is very simple. Could you, Professor Flannery failed to answer this in uh, the Gold Coast when I asked him publicly. Could you provide us with one piece of specific real world scientific evidence that shows human production of carbon dioxide has caused global warming. Just one piece, real world. This, this might be an opportunity, Tim, to. Yeah, yeah look, uh, <clears throat> again, that's a question that we get asked quite a bit. It might be useful if I show a few graphs here uh, rather than just talk around in words. I, I think that might help a little bit. So perhaps if we can go, if this works right, I'll be able to do that. Yeah, so I'll just give you a few graphs to talk about the two questions. The first one, is the climate changing and in what ways? And second of all, what is the reason, which is the question that you just asked me. So let's just start. This is a uh, temperature record from 1880 uh, going off to 2010. It just fell off the right-hand side of the, the picture there. But you can see the four different major data sets around the world, one Japanese, two American, one UK. They all show the same thing particularly since the middle of last century, from 1950, 1960. Is that, are these ground-based measurements or atmospheric measurements? These are ground-based measurements, and, the, and, they have, and they have to be because there were no satellites, of course, at 1900 and so on. That's obvious. But if you put the satellite uh, measurements of the lower atmosphere, uh, which come in the last 30 years or so, you get exactly the same trend. Uh, they lie on top of one another. No, they lie on top of one another. Uh, and, that's clear, and that's clear in the data. No, that's not, that's not at all false. Now, one, one of the interesting things is that some people, like this gentleman here, have challenged this temperature record. There's been a study recently done by physicists at the University of California, Berkeley, under Professor Muller's uh, guidance. And he was a bit of a denier, challenging this, saying uh, that this is dodgy data, that it's been, been doctored, and so on. Just two days ago, he released his completely independent study of temperature measurements around the world, uh, checking on the climate scientists. And this is what he shows. His are in black. They lie right on top of what the climate scientists are saying. So there's no doubt, none whatsoever, in the credible scientific community uh, that the Earth is warming. Now, I want to say these are temperatures at the Earth's surface in the atmosphere and in the lower atmosphere by satellite. They all agree they give the same trend. Now, the point, though, that we need to understand is that the most important part of the Earth, in fact, is the ocean. It covers two-thirds of the Earth's surface has a much larger heat capacity uh, than the land. So we need to look at the ocean. We need to look at the ice also to see what's happening. So let's do that on this picture. These are some observations of the loss of Arctic sea ice. That's the ice over the Arctic Ocean. And if you look at that red line, observations from 1950 uh, to 2008 or 9, and you see that it's clearly dropping. We're losing ice. That's because there's strong warming in the, in the northern hemisphere. This is the ocean temperature record. The black line there is uh, won by a CSIRO group from Hobart, John Church, who's one of the world's experts on measuring ocean temperature. So here we're looking at the top 700 uh, meters of the ocean surface. That's where more than 85% of the extra heat is actually going. 
And again, you see a clear trend, particularly from about 1960, 70 onwards, and look past 1998 or 2000, still strong rises in ocean temperature, and that's where most of the heat is going. And this is all in, in the peer-reviewed literature by the best scientific groups around the world. And you see this in sea level rise too. This graph in the upper left is sea level rise. Uh, again, you see measurements by tide gauges up until about 1995 when we had satellite measurements, satellite altimeters. They agree very, very well with the tide gauges. Sea level is rising. Over that time, it's been rising at about 1.7 millimeters per year. That has increased to about 3.2 millimeters per year over the last 15 years or so. All of this is consistent. All of this is done by the best research groups around the world. All of it's published in the scientific literature, peer-reviewed literature, and there's no debate. We use the word unequivocal, that the Earth is warming. Okay. Let's put this in a longer time frame, because people say, well, the Earth is always warmed and it's always cooled. So isn't this just natural variability? What we have here is a, a nearly 2,000-year temperature record from the northern hemisphere. We don't have enough data from the south yet. Uh, to be able to do a similar graph for the south. And that's because we have much, many fewer scientists down here. Most of them are actually in the north. So if you look at this, you do indeed see a lot of variability naturally in temperature. And around 1,000 to 1,200, 1,300, you can see the medieval warm period, uh, which was, is a known phenomenon. You can actually see also the little ice age around 1,600 to 1,800. But the red line at the end is the post-industrial revolution curve of global temperature. And you see that it looks different from the rest of them. It's rising at a very rapid rate. And the temperature at the end of that graph, at the year 2000, is considerably above anything in the past 2,000 years. So that's one piece of many pieces of evidence that tell us that this is not natural variability that we're seeing. We're seeing something else after the Industrial Revolution. Well, I could show you that too. Now let's, let's go then and look at what might be causing uh, this temperature rise. A lot of people say, well, it could be the sun. The sun, in fact, is the ultimate driver of the Earth's climate. It provides the energy source from outside the system. But since 1980, we've had very good measurements of incoming solar radiation into the Earth. And you see quite clearly there the 11-year sunspot cycle, which we know a lot about. But if you look at the overall trend, there is no trend from left to right in that graph. In fact, the only trend you see is a very, very slight downward trend. We're heading toward a solar minimum. Uh, so the solar activity has gone down a little bit, which means temperature should be slowly going down. If we look at CO2, that's the CO2 record from Mauna Loa when we first started measuring it very accurately from 1958 on to the present. And you see it's been going steadily upwards. We know exactly where that's coming from. About 80% of it's coming from the burning of fossil fuels. About 20% is coming from deforestation. Now, the other point to make is we know the physics of this gas. We've known it since the 1850s. You can go into any chemistry laboratory around the world, and you can take a test tube of carbon dioxide or methane or other greenhouse gases, and you can irradiate, irradiate it with heat, with infrared radiation, exactly the same wavelengths that come out of the Earth's surface. And these gases absorb those, or absorb certain amounts of them. And they re-radiate those, and some of that extra heat comes back down to the Earth's surface and gives us extra warmth. As a matter of fact, if we didn't have greenhouse gases, the Earth would be 33 degrees Celsius colder. It would be frozen all the time. So nature puts up greenhouse gases. It warms the planet. Humans put up greenhouse gases. Exactly the same physics. The physics has been known since 1850. So there you see temperature, or you see CO2 going up. Solar, incoming solar radiation is not going up. But we expect from the physics of the gases that the temperature should go up. And indeed, it is going up. So you see, again, since 1960, CO2 going up quite strongly, and again, since 1960, a clear trend in temperature. There's wiggles in the temperature line, of course. There's variability from year to year. But the underlying trend is quite clear, temperature going up. So the physics is right, the correlation is right, and there's indeed even further evidence. These graphs show that the temperature is going up simultaneously all around the world. You see continent by continent, it's going up. Those wavy blue thick lines are what we expect if it's only sun affecting the climate. The purple thick lines are what we expect if it's sun plus extra greenhouse gases. And the black lines are what we observe. So it's quite clear that there's a very good match between what we expect from the basic radiation balance at the Earth's surface and what we observe if we include the extra greenhouse gases in the atmosphere.
Final point I want to make is that they're so-called fingerprints uh, that tell us what is causing the warming. Because warming that would be caused by solar radiation, for example, looks different from warming caused by greenhouse gases. First of all, we have a globally synchronous signal, which is telling us that it's not the regional variability we saw, for example, in the medieval warm period, or we see with other patterns of natural variability, like, like the North Atlantic Oscillation. So this is globally synchronous. It's occurring globally at the same time. The second point, the lower atmosphere, the thing we call the troposphere, is warming. But the stratosphere, the atmosphere above it, which is actually closer to the sun, is cooling. If it was sun, this wouldn't happen. They would both be warming. This is a fingerprint of greenhouse gases, which are a belt of gases, primarily in the lower atmosphere. Last, winters are warming more than summers. Overnight minimum temperatures going up more than daytime max maximums. These are consistent with greenhouse warming, but not solar warming. So the point is, there is a very strong body of evidence from many different directions which says that the primary cause of the warming we've seen since the middle of the last century are the extra greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And it goes right back to fundamental physics that have been known for well over 100 years. So just to conclude, scientists say warming of the climate system is unequivocal. There's no doubt about that. In the reputable scientific community, those that are, are climate scientists who publish in the peer-reviewed literature in the climate sciences, and it is very likely, and that very likely means I can say that with more than 90% confidence, that that range of evidence, that body of evidence, says that human emissions of greenhouse gases, and the main one of those is carbon dioxide, have caused most of this warming. This is about as close as, as consensus, to consensus as you get in the scientific community. So I hope that, uh, I, I thought it might be useful to put all that out there now uh, so you understand exactly where the, where the science is coming from. Which one? The one the increase in CO2 that shows the seasonal variation. Yeah. What? No, look. Could you just go back there, please, because you were just the audience. This one? Right yeah. There. Now, Will said that the undulations are just natural variations. No, I didn't. No, Thank I you. Didn't. That's what you said. I said nothing about the undulations in CO2. Yes, you did. You no, said there's not, sorry, you said there's natural variation in there. Now, no. let's hear what it is. What is up and down uniform undulations, Will? Well, that's, that's the biosphere in the northern hemisphere. That is the, the biosphere in the northern hemisphere and the ocean in the southern hemisphere. Now, the last no, time the I remember, the, the seasonal variations on this planet are Excuse due me, largely sir. to um, the we're not, we're not here to make statements no, tonight. No, we're here, we're here I, to conduct a respectful question, conversation. And I believe that the professor has answered your question, and Tim I think Flannery. that we need to give some other people an Tim opportunity. Thank you. Could I, I just want to make a, one point, if I could. I think the, 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 reason I, the, the reason I was going to give you a second opportunity to, to answer was a question you asked, is there one single piece of evidence that would convince us that CO2 is causing the warming of the planet? Now, in the, in, in the work Will was talking about that's been done in a laboratory way back in the 1850s where someone got a, a little, you know, test tube full of CO2 and could demonstrate the warming potential, in a laboratory you can isolate all of the factors so you can really explain it. I'd love to be able to put the earth in a laboratory and answer your question and, and show the one single factor. The trouble is we can't. It's a, it's a big complex system we can't isolate in a laboratory, so we have to rely on data such as that that Will showed us, which is observations of the natural system, computer modelling and so forth. So I think that, if I could just say that's as close as I can come to answering that question. But we do need to move on. Thank you, Tim. Right. Does anyone else have a question that they'd like to ask the commissioners? Uh, yes, the, the gentleman down here in the blue shirt, please. There's a clear problem with the uh, diversion of debate between the science and the peer-reviewed science and public opinion, which seems to be largely driven by journalists and uh, others with vested interests. How can, uh, how can uh, the science meet with these um, objections that are coming from these interests um, in a way that actually moves us forward. Sure. I think that's probably one for you, Tim. Yeah, sure. And I can really only speak from personal experience with this and, and tell you that it is incredibly hard to be heard as, as a scientist because uh, th that sort of data doesn't often make it into the, into the newspapers. 
and um, it looks quite often, and there's a tendency to balance, you know, the journalists always want balance in the story as they say it, so what they tend to do is balance a world of scientific credibility against an opinion by someone and make it look as if it's the same thing. Very, very difficult. But the role of the Climate Commission is really very much in that space that you've identified. You know, we, we're there for the long term, we've got a four-year period, um, and, and I just, I really strongly believe that unless we can um, get a better informed public opinion around this, it's going to be very hard to get enduring reforms that are required to, to deal with the issue. So it does start with, with the public, and um, nights like this are important in that regard. I wish I had a better answer for you. I wish I could wave a magic wand and say we we're going to make cut through another way. But I think it's just going to be really difficult and it is going to be uh, people coming to events like this and talking to friends and so forth, us engaging with businesses. Today we visited two businesses in, in the Ipswich area and, and, and met you know, workers and, and um, management there. So that, that's all valuable and I think it slowly adds up. Thanks, Tim. The gentleman down here in the tweed. Hi, I'm uh, Phil Hassett. And um, I, I'd, like to, uh, I'd like to be able to help Tim. Um, I think I'm probably fairly similar to maybe millions of Australians. Um, I am currently still sceptical, uh, but I am a responsible citizen. I totally believe in taking action that's appropriate. And I notice in your uh, duties, I'm sorry if this takes a little bit longer than 20 seconds, I notice in your duties that, that essentially what you really are is an advocacy uh, group. You, you, you're not really here to sort of uh, be persuaded of anything other than well, what, you, what you are putting forward. Um, and so really you're in the business of selling uh, the requirement of changes to us, the public. And, and my background, I, I, I'm originally a mathematician but I've been in sales for about 30 years. Right. Uh, so I, I'd like to give you five very important bits of advice, if you, if, if you will bear with me. Is, is there it a is question? important. Phil, is yes, there, there a question? Is. The, is there the, a question, question, or is the it... question is for you to respond to this because it's important. It, it, it's, uh, believe me, it will help you if you can come to grips with this. Perhaps we could start with one. one Perhaps first... we could start with one and then the professor can respond to the, that. The, the, the first one is if you're going to sell something to people, don't insult them. Okay? When you use the term denier, which is not a term which is compatible with science. The correct term is sceptic, okay? Um, so that's, that's the first bit of advice. The second bit of advice... What's the it, I beg your pardon? What's the, question? the question is to comment on this in terms of what the, the role of the, of the, uh, the group is. All right, well, perhaps, the, we'll, we'll, perhaps we'll let the professor re respond could, to your, your respond first to point first and, then, and then we might... We otherwise, we'll have yeah. a very long session. Um, look, we're not here to sell anything. We're here to engage in a discussion about the science. You have some of the world's scientific experts in that area here this evening who can answer questions and deal with any aspects of, of uncertainty. We've got Jerry Houston here from the business world who can answer questions about a business response. So we're here to engage in a dialogue, right? At the end of the day, people who are here are going to make up their mind about what they've heard. I haven't used the term denier, neither has anyone else this evening, so I don't know why that's come up as a question. Did you? I didn't. Sorry, I must have missed that. Okay. The, the reason that, well, for me, the scientists are the real sceptics. I mean, because we just don't believe anything. We, we keep on testing the data, going back to it. We try to prove ourselves wrong. And we look at a range of probabilities into the future. Well, if I'm going to be, sorry. If I'm going to be confined to just one more point, I'll just make this, because this is by far the most important. If you're going to sell something, you know, don't try and do the bait and switch approach, and I'm sorry, but this is what's happening, because, in fact, the way this is being put forward is as if it's one issue. In other words, take it all. You know, yes, this is happening, and all the points that this gentleman were about was essentially only one of eight separate independent issues that are involved, and I don't need to spell them out. You know what they all are. But, for example, you know, we we've, we've haven't heard any public debates in terms of, even if it were true, that, that all of the uh, assertions you're making were correct. Who's to say, number one, that uh, climate change is actually a bad thing? All right. Well, let's, Who's to say let's, that? Let's let Tim respond to that yeah. and then I think we might move on. Thank you, sir. Look, uh, we've, we have got an expert in that area here of, of impacts who is, is Leslie Hughes. I don't know. Leslie, do you want to have a go at that question? Is it all a bad thing or is it? Um, well, the short answer is no, it's not all a bad thing. It depends on who and what you are. 
Um, there were, I, I'm an ecologist. I've been working on the potential and, and observed impacts of climate change on species and ecosystems for the last 20 years. And what we do know is that, that every species will be affected differently by climate change. Depends on what they are and where they are. Um, there'll be some species that are currently, for example, limited by cold in their distribution that will be able to expand. Just confine it to the human species. All right, well, well the, the, natural, the natural ecosystems are our life support system. We wouldn't be here without a lot of those other species. That's what we eat and that's what forms our habitat. So um, we, we can't really see the human species in isolation. I think that's a real mistake. Um, there will be some humans that, that, that do well, you know, they'll be able to grow wheat perhaps where they haven't been able to before. But on the whole, the, the indications are that m there will be many, many negative impacts of climate change. There will be a lot of risks. There will be increases in the intensity and frequency of many sorts of extreme events, in, not just in Australia but, but elsewhere. Um, and there will be an awful lot of people very, very vulnerable and there will be an awful lot of species and ecosystems very vulnerable to those extreme events. So um, it depends on who and what you are as to, as to whether it'll be a good thing. Um, our, our feeling is at the moment that for the majority of species um, there will be negative impacts. Thank you, Leslie. The, the best sort of global summary of, of impacts really is Lord Stern's report. On, he it's in economic terms, but he says that you know the cost of not acting is five times higher than acting, which is sort of a summary, really, of the of the fact that adverse impacts are going to be uh, substantial and quantifiable in a, in economic sense. No, I don't. Well, well, I, I don't really have time to address all of these very good arguments, but anyone else wants to ask a specific question. We haven't heard anything yet about the carbon tax, and I know in the pre-registered questions there's, there's been quite a bit of concern about that, so we might take one of those, and perhaps we'll address that question to Jerry, who's our industry expert. Jerry, how will the carbon tax um, affect prices? And the, the questioner, who's anonymous in this instance, asks, I ask this because of the alarmist predictions being put about. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, um, I'd, I'd prefer to sort of... Um talk about it as, a, as, a, as a, in the concept of a carbon price. Um, you know, a carbon tax is, is, uh, is one way in which you actually put a price on carbon, emissions trading scheme is another, and there's various other ways you can do it. Um, and the whole idea of putting a price on carbon is, has a twofold effect. Uh, one, it, uh, it, it, uh, it provides an additional incentive for people consuming products that have you know, high energy or high carbon content um, to reduce their consumption of them. And the other part is it, it acts as an incentive for people to invest in reducing um, you know, the, the, the emissions intensity of, of production of products as well. So it's a big incentive for industry to reduce their impact on CO2 emissions. So it has, has a, you know, a, a double impact. Um, there are other ways in which you can actually um, um, achieve impacts. You can, you can do it through direct regulation. Um, you can do it through providing incentives. Uh, the, the conventional wisdom today is that uh, if, if you haven't got something that sort of drives the market to create the outcome in some shape or form, then it is probably a, least e a less efficient way. So the belief is that you know, putting a carbon price as part of the solution is fundamental to finding a, the lowest cost way to um, achieve you know, a, a, a lower carbon economy in the future. Another question uh, on the same issue from, from Richard Castles of Brisbane. He asks, and, and I think that this is probably pertinent to a lot of Australians, many Australians are terrified of any further increases in the cost of living, which we all know is, is having quite an impact. How will your commission address this fear? Well, I think, you know, if, if you look at the, um, um, you know, the, the sums that have been done out there by various experts and various commentators, they, they talk about, you know, a, a $20 um, price on carbon, um, you know, producing a cost to the average household of you know between five and eight hundred dollars a year, um, and so you know I would I would subscribe to to you know that sort of analysis. But the thing that you know uh, I think a lot of the um, a lot of the rhetoric tends to miss is that every construction that I've seen um, from uh, any of the political parties um, and you know any of the uh, you know any of the propositions that we've seen out there has actually had a lot of that money. That's, uh, that you know that the, you know is derived from that source to 
finding its way back in to support uh, the people who uh, have been impacted by it the most. And so, you know, I, I, I think so. It, it, it ends up becoming a political question is how much impact is it going to have on me personally. It depends entirely on what, um, you know, what political decisions are made as to where any, uh, you know, any money is raised from a, you know, a, a price on carbon are put. Thanks, Jerry. Does anyone else have a question? My questions um, to anyone who can answer it, really. I worked in the Solomon Islands back in 1999, um, so a little while ago now, and when I used to travel to the villages, um, a lot of people who'd lived in the villages their whole lives said that the climate was far less predictable than it had been um, previously. I'm just wondering, is anybody doing the work of going around and talking to people such as those people in villages who've lived in the same place their whole lives and hearing their stories? Sure, could I just Do perhaps could answer? Because I have done a bit of work in Africa and in Borneo and other places in New Guinea talking to people about this. And um, you know, a lot of those people who live in those small villages, are, they're exquisitely vulnerable to, to shifts in climate and changes in the weather. So they watch it very carefully and they talk and pass down information from generation to generation. And often they rely on older people in the village to give advice on when to go fishing or when to plant or when to burn or whatever else it is. So they know a hell of a lot about it. And, and what I've discovered wherever I've been is that uh, they're, they're really, people acknowledge there has been a shift. And one of the most difficult situations I was in was in northern Kenya a couple of years back in an area where there was, people were surviving only on food aid really. And I went into a village and um, the old men there had got together to meet me and, and have a bit of a talk. And they just said to me, look, we're useless now because the advice we, we used to be able to provide to the young men of where to take the herds and everything, which has worked since time immemorial for us and our parents and parents before that, is it's now useless. We can't predict anything anymore because there's been this fundamental shift and we, we, we just we don't know now where to send people. And so I think that, that you know, there, there is information being gathered on that, but certainly my personal experience is that they know uh, really a lot more about it than us often who live in a house with air conditioning and aren't quite so dependent upon that information. Okay, perhaps we'd better go back over this side. The gentleman with the, uh, the light grey shirt, please, in the third row. Jeff Derrick's my name. I just have uh, a number of questions, but we'll start with one for now. Um, it's to do with the average CO2 content that we have all around us at the moment in the world of about 390 parts per million. Uh, probably in this room you might be looking at a thousand parts per million and probably an average office would be operating also at about that same parts per million of CO2. Uh, we also breathe out, as I'm doing now, uh, and yourselves as well, about 40,000 parts per million CO2. So my question then is why do you claim CO2 then to be a pollutant? Yeah, look, I'll, I'll have a initial response to that. Look, CO2 does many, many things. CO2 is absolutely fundamental to carbon-based life forms. We know that. Uh, in fact, it's arguably much more important to plants than it is to us because it's their basic building block uh, for their carbohydrates, which then feed our animals and feed us directly. But it has other characteristics too. And uh, the point I made earlier is that one of those characteristics we've known for well over 150 years is that it does affect the energy balance at the Earth's surface. And uh, so when you put that same CO2 that we're breathing out, that filling this room, as, it, as you have trillions of tons, which you have about 3 trillion tons, that's what 390 parts per million actually is, about 3 trillion tons. That's a lot of CO2. Uh, in that belt, in the middle lower atmosphere around the Earth, that changes the energy balance at the Earth's surface because of the fundamental physics of that molecule. So it acts in very many, many different ways. To give you a little basic analogy, if you have a heart problem, you can take some digitalis, and it's very, very good for you. Very tiny amount, and it's very good for you. You take double that, very tiny amount, and it will kill you. So, so different chemicals have different qualities, uh, and we need to differentiate the impact that CO2 has on the climate compared to the impact it has on uh, plants, animals, and so on. Heston Blumenthal, a TV chef of some notoriety at the moment, he's actually got carbon dioxide on his menu and he lists as an ingredient in many of his dishes. So I'm just wondering what sort of health warnings you have for the people that attend his fat duck restaurant in London. Look, 
Could I, I, I think one way of looking at this is a little bit, uh, you mentioned that CO2 is entirely natural, it is, and it, it helps, obviously plants can't grow without it and whatever else. But in excess, we classify it as a pollutant because we need to regulate it, right? It, it's very much like sewerage. I mean, sewerage is fantastic for plant growth, you know? We, we need to fertilise our fields, but when, when it accumulates in our cities, we, need, we know we need to pay for the sewaging of the city and deal with it. And, I, you know, when you look at the development of our, of our civilization, it's all been around dealing with pollutants. We've had to do it from the various, very earliest times when an accumulation of food scraps around the, the, the village might have led to disease or whatever. And this, I think, the way I see it, we're just in a general progression in that way. We need to regulate our outputs to make sure we keep, keep ourselves safe. Thanks, Tim. We might move on, I think, to another question. Uh, the lady down here in the black, please. I'm sorry, this isn't a question, it's a comment that a lot of people are saying that because they breathe out CO2 it's perfectly normal. The point is that the CO2 we breathe out originally came from the atmosphere and I think that point is very important to point out to people that the CO2 we're concerned about is the, the carbon that was in the ground that we're busily digging up and releasing into the air. Thank you. That's an excellent point. You, we may have a spot for you on the commission. We Thank might get you. a response on that. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just say quickly, I'll give you an A-plus for your knowledge of the carbon cycle. <laughs> All right. Um, the gentleman over here with the, uh, the mustard-coloured shirt on, please. Good evening. Um, thanks for coming tonight, commissioners. Um, I share your views, uh, Professor Flannery, that uh, it would be good if we had a higher level of debate. But I don't understand why it is the Australian media seems to lean considerably to the left. I get my left right, yeah. Now, the reason why I say this, and I'll make my question very quick, but there have been many issues in the last month alone that have highlighted the doubts over the carbon, the need for a carbon tax. I'll just give you two examples and then I'll give you my question. Now, over 31,000 scientists in America have signed a petition against the carbon tax in the United States. It's easily to access on the, what's called the petitionproject.org. And the second point I want to make is just released yesterday or the day before was that they've found, World Bank research has found that um, to approximately 192,000 deaths a year have occurred due to increased biofuel production and increased food prices, which wouldn't be happening if we didn't have this whole silly debate. Now, my question to you simply, commissioners, is this. The thing is, um, how many more dissenting scientists Sending scientists will it take for our civic leaders before um, to treat all fraudulent scientific information with the disdain it deserves? And secondly, please, if you could, just name three attendees at either Copenhagen or Cancun conferences who rode their bicycles from the airport or stayed in tents. Thank you. Do, you, do, do either of you know anything about this petition yeah, by 31,000 scientists? I know, I know a little bit about this, this petition. It's been going around for quite a while. You need to differentiate types of scientists. Uh, for example, I'm not competent to, comp to comment on neuroscience or uh, inorganic chemistry or something like that. I'm not an expert in the field. Uh, so if you go through that list of 31,000 scientists, uh, I couldn't recognize any that I, I recognize as publishing in uh, the, the range of literature that covers climate science. Uh, so the, the issue there is uh, that list really doesn't carry any weight at all uh, in the credible scientific community. They don't publish. So, so I think the issue there is, is that um, the credibility of the scientists involved, you earn that, you keep that by publishing in the peer-reviewed literature. That's the quality control mechanism that we use that any area of science uses. So that is not, in my view, uh, a good criterion to judge what the scientific community says. You mu simply must go into the literature in the field uh, to understand that. So, sorry, sorry. And well, just we're just going to let we're just we're just going to let uh, Jerry pick up on that point. Thank you, Jerry. Yeah, just just picking up on the ethanol point, um, and you know, I assume that you're referring to the to the U.S. largely, um, but the um, you know the principal driver behind uh, ethanol has got very little to do with uh, CO2. In fact, you look at the, the total life cycle of some of the production of ethanol, and it's no better than the alternatives that it, uh, that it uh, pushes out. So um, it's, all about, it's all about energy security. It's all about energy security in the US. And, and I agree with you. I think that it's really problematic the way that it cuts into the, uh, cuts into the food chain. Thanks, Jerry. Um, the gentleman down here in the glasses, please. Hello, my name is uh, David Eisentrager, 
and I work in the construction industry. So my question to you is, uh, being the environmental guy in the office, I tend to be the kicking boy because the other 99% are engineers. However, I have a great deal of trouble convincing them of the science of climate change, which I do agree with you, because the question I always get asked is, there are so many variables that affect so many other variables in the whole debate about warming, and engineers, or most professionals in the construction industry or in business, are driven by an economic paradigm. So my question to you is, how do we quantify this science in the period of our lifetime, so over probably the last generation, 30 years, that we can grasp and put this into a business paradigm that everyone can grasp? There's a little bit of science and a little bit of industry there, so should we start with, with Will, maybe, and then Jerry might yeah. be able to uh, pick up. Yeah, look, that, that, that's a really good question, and, and I didn't have time, and I apologise for getting into the quantification of a lot of these things that, that we put up. But in fact, we can quantify uh, by how much carbon dioxide uh, raises temperature with the given increase. The tricky point, and you quite rightly pointed out that this is a complex system, uh, is that there are feedbacks which act to amplify or diminish the effect of CO2, and we've got to sort those out. Uh, now, there still is some debate in the scientific community about how much those amplification effects actually are. But the best estimate is about a total of three degrees for a doubling of CO2 plus the amplification. Now, if that's right, we can calculate by how much we should see the climate warm today, because we're part way to that doubling. And when you do the sums, I didn't have time to do it, you pretty much get the answer that we observe. So that gives us some confidence uh, that not only do we have the physics right, we have the quantification right of how much we should see. Now, in terms of, a, of an economic or business paradigm, that's outside of my area of expertise, so I'm going to turn it over to Jerry for that one. Yeah, and, and just to add very simply, you know, in business, you're in the, you know, it's in the, you're in the game of risk-reward. And I, I certainly know when, you know when I was working for the oil industry that we saw um, you know, the, the whole move to a lower carbon environment um, you know, as... as if we didn't think about that as significant risk to our business model, then uh, we probably shouldn't have been in business because we are in the business of risk reward. So, you know, every business, I think, should be thinking about, um, you know, taking a risk-based view of what could happen in the future. You do it for everything else you're doing in business and deciding what impact is that going to have on a business in the, in the, in the, you know, the sort of short, medium and longer term and what, you know, what insurance will I take out to, um, to make sure that it, doesn't take me by surprise, as you know, in my business. Yeah, but the models that calculate risk right. Get from the Who else has a question? Over this side, the gentleman in the third row in the dark blue shirt, please. Hi, uh, my name's Jordan. Um, I read a book by uh, Professor Ian Plymer, and uh, he talks about the medieval warming period. And uh, his point of view was that it was um, more significant to the uh, warming that we are seeing at the moment. So um, I'd like to get a comment on that. Yeah, look, um, th it's, it's interesting to do that comparison because there are some specific places where the paleo evidence suggests it was indeed warmer. But when you look at the entire Earth, and I made the point up there that in the contemporary warming, the one we're seeing now, it's reasonably uniform around the planet. Southern Hemisphere is warming just about as much as the North. If you look at the medieval warm period, uh, it was very much skewed toward the North Atlantic region spreading out a little bit more to other parts of the northern hemisphere, not much warming uh, in the southern hemisphere. And when you look more broadly across the northern hemisphere, the level of warming averaged is significantly lower than what we see today. So the, the evidence that if you go into the peer-reviewed literature uh, does not support uh, the point of view that Professor Plymer put forward in his book. And what do we see in the way of impacts from that, Leslie? Uh, in the medieval warm period? Or in today's world, what Into sort of impacts are we, are we seeing? Well, I, I don't know how long we've got, but let me just give a couple that are, I think, Make, really relevant to Queensland. Yeah, like the Barrier example. Reef, for example. Yeah. Okay, the Barrier Reef. Um, uh, the Barrier Reef brings in about $6 billion to your economy every year in Queensland and employs about 68,000 people, so that's the economic context of it. Um, the, the Barrier Reef will be one of the ecosystems in the world about which we can be 
most confident of the impacts of climate change, and that's because we understand the physiological impact of temperature on coral reefs um, better than for almost anything else. Um, coral reefs exist about a degree or two away from complete catastrophe in the summer period, and if the sea surface temperature gets above one or two degrees above what the corals are used to, um, they bleach, and I'm sure you've all heard about coral bleaching, um, and they die. And the, the projected temperature increases over the next few decades indicate that we could get to a situation where the corals are bleaching every year rather than every few years. So we've had about eight different bleaching events since the late 1970s, and we don't know of any bleaching before that. It's getting more frequent, it's getting more widespread. Um, and so what we might expect in, say, 10, 20, 30 years' time um, is that the coral reefs will be replaced by algal communities because they simply won't be able to recover. So, um, you know, we wipe out the coral reefs, we wipe out thousands of species, and that's, uh, you know, in Queensland in particular, um, an extremely significant part of the economy. Thanks, Leslie. We have a question down here, please. Um, the recent uh, Japanese disaster, which uh, seems to have been uh, a near worst case one, uh, but which uh, has, seems to have only had a relatively minor effect, has convinced George Monbiot uh, to convert to become an advocate of nuclear energy. Uh, don't you think that it's hypocritical of the warmest uh, who claim that we are facing a serious problem, uh, yet who are not willing to uh, advocate uh, the only major uh, non-hydrocarbon source of base load power? Look, I think that you know, any energy production system comes with risks, and it's a matter of how you evaluate those risks, as well as the costs. And you know, for a place like Australia, I guess my personal view is that we're, we're 22 million people on a continent the size of the contiguous 48 states of the USA. We're almost uniquely blessed with renewable energy resources. We've got one of the world's best two or three wind resources. We've got the best hot, dry rock resource on the planet. We've got abundant solar. In this country, it seems to me likely that we're never going to need nuclear power, that we're going to need, that we're going to be uh, sustainable in terms of just using renewable energy. That's not true for other parts of the world. Places like eastern China have huge, enormous population densities without any of the benefits that we see in Australia, and there they are building nuclear power uh, at a very rapid rate. They're going from 7% of their total energy mix in China nuclear through to 22% by 2030. In those situations, you know, they, the Chinese obviously perceive that it's worth uh, risking uh, the meltdown of a plant or, or damage of a plant such as seen in Japan. But these are issues for national governments and they'll all be evaluated differently. Thanks, Tim. And back over this side of the room to the gentleman in the front row, the second in, please. Good day. Um, my name is Dr Guy LeBlanc-Smith. I'm a retired principal research scientist with the CSIRO. My doctorate is in reconstruction of ancient environmental systems. I've watched with some degree of interest the debate as such going on. I've got a number of questions which I've been putting into the system, both through Parliament when I was with CSIRO uh, and subsequently. Uh, but basically I'd like to know, uh, and you could brief preface these with, why do you ignore the following? In the comments on the Barrier Reef, I don't know if the public generally realizes that we've just come out of a major ice melt out 18,000 years ago. And what that means in terms of environment and where we are now is sea levels were 130 meters lower than now. So the entire Barrier Reef was dry land at that stage. There was no coral. It was dry land with wallabies and trees. 11,000 years ago, during the event which caused this melt-out, no human involvement, no CO2. The continental ice sheets melted, sea levels rose, the land drowned to a level where the outer barrier reef formed 11,000 years ago. Why is this fact ignored? The inner barrier reef, Charlotte Bay, and so on. So only 15 meters deep, that formed 7,000 years ago. Corals populated that. We need to give nature and the corals credit for being resilient. They'll move, 
if the environment gets uncomfortable. They are well, incredibly All right, I think, I think we've probably got the gist of All the right. question. Um, who, maybe, um, Les, I, I think Leslie and I will do a, a tag team on this. Um, what you're referring to is the, the Earth system coming out of the last ice age, last glacial maximum about 20,000 years ago, into the Holocene uh, about 12,000 or so years ago. The, um, the change in global average temperature from that shift was on order of five or six degrees. That's the difference between an ice age and a warm period. Uh, that was driven, as you said, quite naturally by small changes in the Earth's orbit, which changed the, the pattern of incoming solar radiation. But CO2, in fact, is strongly implicated in this because there's a feedback loop between CO2 uh, and temperature, and that has largely to do with the ocean. So there's a lot of CO2 stored in the ocean, much more than on land. And as the ocean warms, less CO2 is dissolved in it. In other words, CO2 is more soluble in cold water. So the initial warming, which is caused by changes in solar radiation, kicked off uh, one of two big, well, kicked off two big feedback loops. One of those, in fact, was a CO2 uh, feedback loop. Uh, but the other point I do want to make is that the Earth went through uh, a sea level change and a temperature change, temperature change being five to six degrees, on order of 5,000 years. And you're quite right that many systems on land and in the ocean uh, adjusted to that. But what we're looking at uh, in an unmitigated climate world uh, is a temperature rise of four or five degrees uh, by the end of this century. This is in an unmitigated world. We don't do anything at all uh, about CO2 emissions. Uh, and we're going to go through that temperature rise in a century or a century and a half. This puts enormous uh, evolutionary pressure on organisms, which took several thousand years to go through the same uh, change. So you're, you're quite right in terms of the magnitude, magnitude change was quite great between an ice age and now. But the time frames are completely different. And that's the thing that worries ecologists and biologists. And I'll let Leslie add a, a few I, words I to that. I need to just add to, one clarification just... here, and that is at the time of the onset of the warming, the carbon dioxide measurement of the world, was as measured in the yeah. ice core data, which I have and have plotted up, it's publicly available, 2,600 years before the CO2 responded and started to rise after the melt yeah. occurred. That's what I said. And Mr. there's a lag. So the temperature is actually driving the CO2. Can I, can I quickly respond to that? It's a feedback mechanism. This is what we mean by Earth is a complex system. Temperature drives the initial outgassing of CO2. But that CO2 rise then increases the temperature, which then, of course, drives more CO2 to come out. So that's one of two big feedback loops. The other one is the so-called ice reflectivity, is that there's a lot more ice during an ice age, as the name indicates. And as the Earth starts warming, that ice starts retreating. And that uncovers darker ocean or darker land, and it absorbs more sunlight which adds to regional warming and the ice retreats further. So these are very well known. Uh, and if you only looked at this, the change in solar radiation, you would only get a shift of about a degree from an ice age to a warm period. So these feedbacks are very important. They drive about 80% of the temperature change. So over to you, Leslie. If I could just add something specifically about corals. Um, I was at um, a conference just the previous part of the week, Greenhouse 2011 in, in, in Cairns. And Professor Ove Hoguberg from the University of Queensland, who is really one of the world's um, uh, most um, well-known experts on coral reef ecology, um, gave a talk about the future of the coral reef, which was pretty depressing for most people that were listening to it. And he did a calculation, and he said that for the, the corals to keep up with the warming of the oceans, they will need to move south at a rate of 15 kilometres every year. Um, that's the rate of change on a biological scale that biological systems are faced with. So as Will said, yes, it's absolutely true in the past, the climate's changed, ecosystems have, have, have changed, um, and lots of, of organisms have been, and ecosystems have been resilient to that. What our natural ecosystems are faced with now is change that is orders of magnitude greater than they can keep up with. Thanks, Leslie. All right, let's take a question from down the back. The gentleman in the green shirt, please. In terms of, I suppose, energy security, uh, aren't we best moving away from the, the fossil fuels and even things like uranium, which are in limited supply as it is? Uh, but my, I suppose my question is, plant, plant toxicity levels, uh, what effect does increases in CO2 levels have on plant toxicity levels? 
Thanks, Leslie. As has been discussed already, CO2 is a fundamental building block of photosynthesis. If, if plants didn't photosynthesize, we wouldn't have anything to eat. Um, but some really interesting things happen to plants when they grow at high CO2. So for example, there's been probably thousands of experiments now growing plants, comparing their growth and what happens to them at sort of current levels of CO2 and increased levels of CO2. And when you increase levels of CO2, let's say you double it, uh, plants are able to photosynthesize more, they grow faster, they grow bigger, though it does, the response does level off for a while, after a while. But some very interesting things happen to the, the quality of the tissue. So for example, um, plants grow bigger and faster, but they don't take up as much nitrogen. So the ratio of carbon to nitrogen in their tissues um, increases. And this is really important because um, nitrogen is a building block of protein, so when you grow a plant at higher CO2, it actually becomes less nutritious to get the same amount of protein, you have to eat a lot more of it. But as you say, CO2 also does affect plant toxins, and it's rather specific to different sorts of plants, but there are basically two sorts of plant toxins, one's based on carbon and one's based on nitrogen. And when you grow a plant at high CO2, the carbon-based compounds like phenols and tannins, which is what you, you taste when you drink tea, increase. The nitrogen-based compounds like glycosides and alkaloids decrease. So it depends on how the plant is defending itself against things that eat it as to what happens to it when you grow at a high CO2. It's very variable, but when you know something about the composition of plants, you can actually predict it quite well. Thanks, Leslie. All right, the lady in the, um, the glasses, please. Hello, my name's Madonna Oliver. I'm not a scientist, so uh, my question isn't science-based as such. I imagine that discussions such as these have been going on for hundreds of years. Every time there's been major changes socially, I can imagine plantation owners believing that there was only doom in the future when we abolished slavery, and yet we survived. I imagine industrialists thought that introducing a 40-hour working week and safe working conditions would also spell doom for industry, and yet humanity has shown that it is also a resilient creature, able to cope with the changes in society. But given that we are a nation that has built its wealth on digging up our resources, you can imagine where the fear is coming from. So given all that, what does a future look like without the amount of CO2 in the, uh, in the um, environment? I, I might just have a first stab at that one and just say you're quite right about the discussions been going on for a long time. Whenever there's change, there is a, a very valid societal debate about it. Um, but things are often overplayed, and I just need to think back to the ratification of the Kyoto Protocol. I remember our newspapers full of terrifying headlines about ratifying the Kyoto Protocol will destroy the Australian economy and destroy jobs and all of this sort of stuff. And when it happened, it was sort of like a squib, you know, no one noticed. Um, so there is, there is, there is an, a, a, sometimes uh, an overplaying of those sort of things. Um, in terms of Australia, you know, I think we've got to look at it over the longer term. You know, the Australia I grew up in didn't have iron ore mines and not very much in the way of coal exports. The big export that we had was, was sheep, was wool, and wool was worth a pound a pound. And where I grew up in Victoria, you know, uh, graziers would take their favourite ram in the back of the Rolls Royce down into town, you know, these little funny towns that are now half dead in, in Western Victoria. Um, and so it was a very different economy to what we had today. Now things have changed and we've moved on. I can't imagine what the Australian economy is going to look like in in, in 30 or 40 years, but I know it's going to be different from today. And you know, people, I've spoken to some older people in the coal business and they said, look, this was always a boom and bust business. We've made money and gone broke heaps of times in the past and we know that things change. So I don't think we should fear change. You know, sure, we, we need to do what we can to protect ourselves and our economy, but change is inevitable. And part of dealing with climate change is really also grasping the opportunities. Now, we were at the University of Queensland today having a look at some of the incredible work being done there um, and the technological innovation going on. Just one of the things we saw this morning was a new kind of battery, 
uh, which is being used so that renewable energy can become part of the base load uh, for the state. But those technologies, I'm no expert in battery technologies, but I use batteries. I have a standalone solar system at home, so I use them. And what they were telling me about this battery, it looked fantastic. And there was actually a battery in place with a company there now producing these things. Uh, huge opportunity for Queensland in that sort of thing. Also, um, innovations in solar panel manufacture that, that were on show at the university. Uh, this, and, and, and a lot of research going on about how we optimise the uptake of renewable energy into the, into the grid. Later on, we went to your water treatment plant, your, your, your water recycling plant. Again, just fantastic innovation going on there. And the development of your southeastern Queensland water grid is, is going to stand this state in very good stead, I think. It, it's, it's, I haven't seen anything like it anywhere else in Australia, and it, it just shows how leadership and innovative thinking can help a society like this deal with the stresses that may come with climate change, you know, less water security and so forth. So I think it is a matter of grasping those opportunities and building new business models out of them so that we'll have a future that's more prosperous than the one we've got today. So, and and just, um, just, just to add to that, you know, giving a, a, um, a, a business perspective, um, if, if, if there's a really sudden change and you have to change from one economy to another overnight, then, then you know, that, you know, that can have catastrophic uh, consequences. So, you know, the, 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 you know, the rhetoric that, you know, start earlier and the impacts are going to be less is, I think, you know, um, um, is, is spot on. So, you know, the sooner we start, then the less impact we're going to have um, in, in a, you know, dramatic impact we're going to have. But the other thing is that, you know, if you, if you look at a lot of the debate that's going on in the business community today, it's not about the end game. It's about the transition and particularly about Australia's part in that transition. And, uh, and I think there's, you know, the, there are very legitimate calls out there to make sure that Australia doesn't shoot itself in the foot by imposing something on you know, its, its trade-exposed industries that, are, that don't apply somewhere else. And there needs to be recognition of that. And I think also um, the case is made by the electricity industry that if, if, um, if the appropriate transition is not managed for them, then we could we could have some major problems in terms of continuity of electricity, and that wouldn't be good for Australia. So the transition is very important. Um, I suppose what we'd be advocating is the sooner we start, um, then you know, the less the impact is going to be and a you know, dramatic impact is going to be. Thanks, Jerry. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we are quickly running out of time, so I would really like to get through as many questions as we can in this last 10 to 15 minutes. So if you could please remember to keep them brief, that would be super. All right, we haven't heard from the gentleman down here in the grey shirt, I don't think, have we? Hi, my name is Sean Cleary, work for the Edmund Rice Centre. We do a lot of work with people from Pacific Island communities who have maybe contributed amongst the least to the carbon issue, uh, but who are suffering the most from it. Uh, my question is to get to understand we, our urgent need to reduce carbon emissions in Australia. Um, can you compare and contrast the ETS proposal with the current carbon tax proposal? And I guess especially on the levels of net carbon emissions, uh, and then also as far as community education challenge. Look, it, both of our political parties have pledged to a 5% reduction in emissions um, in the next eight years and eight months. Right? And that is an extremely ambitious target because if you look at the baseline, so we start at 2000 and we want to be 5% below that, what's actually happening with the Australian economy is of course we're growing. The number of Australians are growing, the economy is growing. So emissions, if we let them go, would be 20, I think about 21% is the figure that's been recently revised, but around about 21% above what it was in 2000. So if we add that to the 5% reduction, you're dealing with 26% reduction over what would have occurred otherwise. That's about a quarter. So it's a very ambitious target. Both sides, both major political parties subscribe to it. And we see in both parties have got policies that they believe can achieve those targets. But if we look at the, 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 the carbon tax and the, the, the emissions trading scheme it will evolve into after three to five years, that's all premised within that context, that we'll achieve these very ambitious reductions in that time. And my issue is very much like Jerry's. You know, we've got eight years and eight months to manage this. Every year, every, you know, waste another year and it just becomes that much harder and that much more expensive and we're that much less certain of success. And, and, and I think it's fair to say on the, um, you know, on the difference between, you know, what's on the table today and, and what was on the table with the CPRS is, um, you know, the CPRS was a, was a finished product. What we have today is not a finished product. Um, but, you know, on the face of it, um, 
if the detail ended up like the CPRS, it's the same thing, but slipped a bit. Yeah. yeah. So it's you know. Um. Thank you. Uh, there's a lady over here, um, sort of in the middle of the row. Yes, if you'd like to stand up. Thank you. Hello, my name is Anne Page. Um, I'm a high school teacher and I just want to make a statement that teenagers are very concerned about this issue and they are not sceptical. They would genuinely appreciate what's being discussed here tonight um, and they are worried about their future. And I think for those of us who are here that have the right to vote, I think we need to be aware that we are, um, we are not the long-term um, people who are going to be suffering consequences, it will be the generations to come after us and we're just caretakers. So what's going to happen in our lifetime will have a huge impact in the future. But my question to the panel is this. Um, at the moment there's massive um, development proposed in South East Queensland uh, and it's supposed to be catering for population growth in the next 50 to 70 years. Um, as part of this plan there's an area uh, Ripley just near Ipswich here which is proposed for industry, Greater Flagstone which is in the Green Bank area uh, and Yarrabulba. Uh, approximately in the Greater Flagstone area they're going to increase the population there uh, by about 232,000 people, a city the size of Canberra. Uh, and at the moment uh, the state government is looking at not providing public transport to that community. Uh, until 2031 or possibly later. What would be the panel's response to that? And, and not to mention that there are significant biodiversity issues that are conveniently being ignored as well. I guess it's a public transport issue really, isn't yeah, it, and the importance sure. of... So I just, I'll briefly, briefly comment, and I can't really speak for the whole Commission on this because it's very much my personal view, what I'm giving you, which is really just that for too long we've tried to build this country on the cheap, you know? We're happy to have the additional population and all the economic activity it brings, but then we are very reluctant to spend the money that's needed to actually bring a good quality of life to those people who move into those suburbs. And of course public transport is just a, it's a necessity of life. We, we can't afford to build our society on the cheap anymore. We need to have a proper planning process which, which makes sure that we build and continue to build our quality of life at the same time we deal with the other issues. Thanks, I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that. And I think it's um, you know having the right um, having the right holistic planning for infrastructure development um, to meet the needs of growth is absolutely fundamental. That's politically recognised. It's recognised by the business community. It's recognised by almost everyone you talk to. It's, it's actually trying to get beyond the short termism to actually um, make sure that you're investing appropriately for the future, not just not just meeting a short term need. It's fundamental. Yeah. Yep, okay. There's a, a young fellow down here. Let's hear from you, sir. Hi, guys. Um, Sean Kelly. Um, I was just hoping to ask the Commission to comment on the state of global action on climate change. Look, I chaired the Copenhagen Climate Council for three years, and over that time we got a good look at what was happening uh, globally. Um, it's probably, well, let's start with the obvious. Europe has now had an emissions trading scheme for about five years. Um, that scheme's recently been evaluated by the US German Marshall Fund and it's shown that it is effective in reducing emissions, so it's helping Europe achieve its targets. Um, if you ask Europeans about the impact of the scheme on, on their lives, the ones I've spoken to, they don't even know really that the ETS is operating. It's just it's in the background changing things, emissions are reducing, but there's, there's you know, people in, in Germany and Britain don't talk about the impact of it. New Zealand has just developed an emissions trading scheme. It's been in place now for about 12 months. The New Zealanders I speak to don't say it's sending them broke or ruining them or anything. They, they, they accept it's just part of the background as well. Places like China are moving forward in very different ways. There they're using government regulation to, to uh, limit the growth in emissions. So emissions are going to continue to grow in China for, for some time, but not as sharply as they have been up to now. And their programs are really heroic in scale. I, I know on our Copenhagen Climate Council we had um, some very major uh, business leaders from China. And we got to meet number four in the, uh, the Chinese uh, Politburo who outlined the plans that they had. And you know, they were concerned because their technocrats were saying, this is such an ambitious program, it's not achievable. You know? um, in fact, they did do it. It cost them some economic growth, but they did do it and they're determined to go on with it. There's not a major government in the world that doesn't have a climate program and policy in place doing something. So, you know, we're moving together. The problem we face, of course, is that we're all doing it in different ways at different rates, 
And as Jerry said, in that context, how do we protect our trade exposed industries? So our aluminium producers, for example, you know, if their price of their aluminium goes up, they'll simply close up and we'll import aluminium from, from elsewhere. So there are transitional issues that are very important for our industries to deal with, but we should never lose sight that the world is moving forward and we're just part of that movement. And just to give you a sense of where we sit relative to others, um, in terms of the uh, uh, carbon costs on carbon, China's costs on carbon are about three times greater than those in this country, when you look at the whole costs. So we're, we're not leading the pack. What I think Australians need to do is do their bit, and that's what we're trying to do as we move forward with the various government programs. Fuel It includes the total cost on carbon, yeah. So we're, we're about a, th a third as much as China, three times. Uh, that you can't, well, you see it's hydrocarbons. You've got to look at just the carbon cost. And in China, the, the total cost on carbon is about $7.50, I believe. Here it's about $2.50. We've only got a couple of minutes to go, ladies and gentlemen. And just please remember, you do have feedback forms on your seats. And any questions that we can't get to tonight, if you'd like to pop them down in your feedback forms, they can be answered on the website and, and at future events. So please um, make use of that facility tonight. The gentleman down here in the blue shirt, please. My name is Alan Radford. If it's any consolation to young people and school teachers in the audience, I can remember back in the late 60s, very early 70s, where all of the eminent scientists of the world were absolutely convinced and screaming in the headlines that we were headed back into an ice age. We've heard all this before, so I, I, I often wonder, in fact, what happened to all of those scientists. But just briefly, th there are some questions I want to ask you. I want to quote you. Um, from three eminent scientists, you keep telling us that, that the issue is settled. One of them says, since I'm no longer affiliated with any organisation nor receiving any funding, I can speak quite frankly. As a scientist, I remain sceptical. The main basis of the claim that man's release of greenhouse gases is the cause of warming is based almost entirely on climate models. We all know the frailty of models concerning air surface Sir, systems. I'm sorry, is, is this coming to a question it fairly should, quickly? It certainly yeah. is. Don't miss it. That was a statement made by the atmospheric scientist, Dr Joan Simpson, the first woman in the world to receive a PhD in meteorology and formerly of NASA... And what was who, the question? ..who has authored 190 studies for peer review. There are others as well. What was the question, please? There are many leading scientists who do not agree with you. Now, when we, when we re I've got pages of it here. No, no, just, now, one, just one question, uh, quest or we'll have to move on, I'm afraid. Is, we're, we're nearly out of the time. The question is, when we in the public start doing our homework and start finding eminent scientists in climatology qualifications who don't agree, that's why we need some explanation. What do you have to say to that? Maybe well, no, I, I don't want to go through the uh, uh, presentation again, uh, but uh, let me just say that... that um, as I said before, it's unequivocal that the planet's warming. Unequivocal is, a, uh, is not a scientific jargon, plain English word. Everybody knows what unequivocal means. The evidence is absolutely there. Second of all, I said that we can say with over 90% confidence that we know why this is occurring. Uh, and you can go into the peer-reviewed literature, and I, I welcome anyone to, to do that, and look for the evidence that's been published in the quality control literature uh, that goes against that. There's very little. The 10% that you might argue about is really the question about how strong the feedbacks are. Nobody doubts that CO2 warms the planet. No one whatsoever. It's fundamental physics. Nothing to do with models. I repeat that. Nothing to do with models. Fundamental physics. The question is, how, how, by how much are those amplifying feedbacks uh, going to increase the temperature rise? And there, the knowledge is getting much stronger. Uh, and there's a pretty good consensus on order of three degrees for a doubling. So that's well understood. None of that requires models. Thanks for that. And we're going to take the final question from the very patient lady over here on my left, please. Sorry, Thank Lisa, you, sir. Lisa, could I just... Um, so the, this lady here that stood up before, I feel very sorry for her because she stood up to ask a question and didn't get a chance. Perhaps we could ask her as well if sure. we could just include yes. her. Yes, maybe we'll hear from the lady over here and then the final question will be from the lady over here. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. My name is Kirsten Kennedy and I work with community groups around uh, South East Queensland about more sustainable living. Uh, and I think maybe this is a very short question. Um, if 
the uh, carbon price, for example, is going to uh, be the stick to industry to say you need to be more efficient, uh, reduce your emissions. What's the uh, Commission's opinion on the carrot in the argument uh, of being more efficient? What's the, um, what's the Commission's opinion on a feed-in tariff, for example, a national feed-in tariff that would stimulate investment in renewable uh, energy in Australia? Um, I, well, I, I think the, um, if, if we move beyond a carbon tax and into, into, you know, into you know, a, a, a real market-based mechanism like, a, like an emissions trading scheme, um, it's a stick and a carrot. Um, it, it, it penalises those that don't do anything, but it actually rewards those that invest. Um, because you know, so those that become more energy efficient, those that become lower carbon in their production, will actually get rewarded, and those that don't um, will find themselves competitively disadvantaged. So I see it as a uh, as a um, you know, as a real stick and carrot. I, I think I said earlier that um, I, I don't. Uh, you know, I don't necessarily subscribe to the theory that you, you know, that there's a silver bullet and you just put in a price for carbon and everything will happen. There's lots of, there's lots of market failures out there, um, and you know, solar is one of them. Where regulation will sometimes help to make things happen um, where there's a market failure. There's also a real issue, and we saw it at the University of Queensland today, is that first movers and bringing in new technology have to spend a hell of a lot of money, which doesn't get remunerated. It's other people who get remunerated down the line when, when they get economies of scale, etc. So that's where I think society has a real role to play through governments to actually um, incentivise people outside just a, a bare price on carbon. All right, and the lady over here, thank you. My name's Denise Medini, and uh, my question does involve some crystal ball gazing. Now, on the graphs we were showing, well, first of all, the population of the world has doubled from 1960 to um, 2010, up to 7 billion people. In the graphs we were shown, there seems to be a correlation between the rapid increase in world population and um, the so-called effects of, um, of climate change. Now. China's starting to get her population under control and so forth. As further countries, some have further to go than others, get their population under control, do you think there'll be less correlation between the effects of, um, of climate change, the various effects, and um, world population? Well, look, the, the, I think the, the thing is that population has been growing at the same time that our affluence has been growing and our energy demands have been growing, and we haven't shifted from a fossil fuel base. So there's, there's two factors, really. There's, there's the technology we use and the population growth as a whole. But just to take the population question for you, the, the United Nations, every two years, does a population projection for the planet. And the last one they did, published last year, was really, really interesting, because what it showed was for the first time since they'd done those projections, the world population at 2050 was shown to be smaller than it would, what was at the previous projection point two years earlier. So it was 40 million less. That's right. Yeah. And, and all of that's due to the, the you know, um, increasing education and, uh, of women in, in the, the poorest countries on the planet and also the, um, the, 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 their increasing economic capacity. So it, the bottom line really is if we work very hard to increase the welfare of the poorest people on our planet, we may end up with a population of only 8 billion by mid-century. If we don't do that, if, if in fact we slow those processes, we may be unfortunate enough to end up with a population of 10 billion and still growing by mid-century. So there's a lot hangs on what we do with our foreign, foreign policy budgets and how we can influence uh, or, or, or really better the lives of the poorest people, particularly women. Uh, on earth. And, 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 just, and just, just following on from that, I think you know, the point you know, Tim made about affluence, um, if, if you look at the sort of per capita emissions, um, it's, it, it's almost a direct correlation between energy use and, and affluence. And, uh, and, and that's the challenge that the Chinas and Indias are facing in the future, is trying to de-link the, the, the way that we've grown our economies over the last 200 years in the developed world. Um, you know, the challenge for China is to try and de-link that to the greatest extent possible. It's not our role, though, to deny them the opportunity to increase their affluence. And I think that's one of the tensions that we see uh, you know, coming towards us. And that's probably a good place to leave it, because, ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid we're right out of time for this evening. And I'm sure you'd agree, though, it's been a very interesting conversation and one I'm sure we could have kept going on for another hour and possibly two on. 
Before I conclude tonight's event, though, I'd like to invite Professor Tim Flannery to make some final comments. Thanks, Tim. Thank you. Great. Well, I'd just like to thank you once again for coming this evening. Thank you for your questions and for the honesty of your questions. Um, this is our second such community meeting, and this one has been really, really interesting. We had quite different questions in many ways from what we got in Geelong, but not one bit less interesting or challenging to us. So I thank you for it. Could I just ask you that um, if you're interested in this topic, take the discussions you've had tonight back out into the community. Talk to your friends and colleagues about it, um, because what we do need is just more informed and better discussion on these issues. We've got very big decisions to make over coming decades as to how we deal with this problem. We're only going to succeed, I think, if we have people like you going out being champions for the debate and, um, and showing a bit of leadership in that area. So thank you once again for coming. Really appreciate it. Thanks very much, Tim. Just a quick reminder, everyone, about those feedback forms um, that you had on your seats when you came in, particularly if you do have a question that you didn't get a chance to ask tonight, it can be answered through the website or at future events. So do take the time to fill those ones out and just leave them on your seat. They'll be collected by the ushers after tonight's event. Fact sheets are also available um, on your way out for anyone who would like more information. Thanks again to our commissioners for their very valuable time here with us this evening. And of course, thank you all very much for your participation, your extremely insightful questions and for coming along tonight. Have a safe trip home and a very good evening. This has a much larger heat capacity uh, than the land. So we need to look at the ocean, we need to look at the ice also to see what's happening. So let's do that on this picture. These are some observations of the loss of Arctic sea ice. That's the ice over the Arctic Ocean. And if you look at that red line, observations from 1950 uh, to 2008 or 9, and you see that it's clearly dropping. We're losing ice. That's because there's strong warming in the, in the northern hemisphere. This is the ocean temperature record. The black line there is uh, won by a CSIRO group from Hobart, John Church, who's one of the world's experts on measuring ocean temperature. So here we're looking at the top 700 uh, meters of the ocean surface. That's where more than 85% of the extra heat is actually going. And again, you see a clear trend, particularly from about 1960, 70 onwards, and look past 1998 or 2000, still strong rises in ocean temperature, and that's where most of the heat is going. This is all in, in the peer-reviewed literature by the best scientific groups around the world. And you see this in sea level rise, too. This graph in the upper left is sea level rise. Uh, again, you see measurements by tide gauges up until about 1995 when we had satellite measurements, satellite altimeters. They agree very, very well with the tide gauges. Sea level is rising. Over that time, it's been rising at about 1.7 millimeters per year. That has increased to about 3.2 millimeters per year over the last 15 years or so. All of this is consistent. All of this is done by the best research groups around the world. All of it's published in the scientific literature, peer-reviewed literature, and there's no debate, we use the word unequivocal, that the Earth is warming. Okay, let's put this in a longer time frame because people say, well, the Earth is always warmed and it's always cooled. So isn't this just natural variability? What we have here is a, a nearly 2,000 year temperature record from the Northern Hemisphere. We don't have enough data from the South yet. Uh, to be able to do a similar graph for the south. And that's because we have much, many fewer scientists down here. Most of them are actually in the north. So if you look at this, you do indeed see a lot of variability naturally in temperature. And around 1,000 to 1,200, 1,300, you can see the medieval warm period, uh, which was, is a known phenomenon. You can actually see also the little ice age around 1,600 to 1,800. But the red line at the end is the post-industrial revolution curve of global temperature. And you see that it looks different from the rest of them. It's rising at a very rapid rate. And the temperature at the end of that graph, at the year 2000, is considerably above anything in the past 2,000 years. So that's one piece of many pieces of evidence that tell us that this is not natural vari variability that we're seeing. We're seeing something else after the Industrial Revolution. Well, I could show you that too. Now let's, let's go then and look at what might be causing uh, this temperature rise. A lot of people say, well, it could be the sun. The sun, in fact, is the ultimate driver of the Earth's climate. It provides the energy source from outside the system. 
But since 1980, we've had very good measurements of incoming solar radiation into the Earth. And you see quite clearly there the 11-year sunspot cycle, which we know a lot about. But if you look at the overall trend, there is no trend from left to right in that graph. In fact, the only trend you see is a very, very slight downward trend. We're heading toward a solar minimum. Uh, so the solar activity has gone down a little bit, which means temperature should be slowly going down. If we look at CO2, that's the CO2 record from Mauna Loa when we first started measuring it very accurately from 1958 on to the present. And you see it's been going steadily upwards. We know exactly where that's coming from. About 80% of it's coming from the burning of fossil fuels. About 20% is coming from deforestation. Now, the other point to make is we know the physics of this gas. We've known it since the 1850s. You can go into any chemistry laboratory around the world, and you can take a test tube of carbon dioxide or methane or other greenhouse gases, and you can irradiate, irradiate it with heat, with infrared radiation, exactly the same wavelengths that come out of the Earth's surface. And these gases absorb those, or absorb certain amounts of them. And they re-radiate those, and some of that extra heat comes back down to the Earth's surface and gives us extra warmth. As a matter of fact, if we didn't have greenhouse gases, the Earth would be 33 degrees Celsius colder. It would be frozen all the time. So nature puts up greenhouse gases. It warms the planet. Humans put up greenhouse gases. Exactly the same physics. The physics has been known since 1850. So there you see temperature, uh, you see CO2 going up. Solar, incoming solar radiation is not going up. But we expect from the physics of the gases that the temperature should go up. And indeed, it is going up. So you see, again, since 1960, CO2 going up quite strongly. And again, since 1960, a clear trend in temperature. There's wiggles in the temperature line, of course. There's variability from year to year. But the underlying trend is quite clear, temperature going up. So the physics is right, the correlation is right, and there's indeed even further evidence. These graphs show that the temperature is going up simultaneously all around the world. You see continent by continent, it's going up. Those wavy blue thick lines are what we expect if it's only sun affecting the climate. The purple thick lines are what we expect if it's sun plus extra greenhouse gases. And the black lines are what we observe. So it's quite clear that there's a very good match between what we expect from the basic radiation balance at the Earth's surface and what we observe if we include the extra greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Final point I want to make is that they're so-called fingerprints uh, that tell us what is causing the warming. Because warming that would be caused by solar radiation, for example, looks different from warming caused by greenhouse gases. First of all, we have a globally synchronous signal, which is telling us that it's not the regional variability we saw, for example, in the medieval warm period, or we see with other patterns of natural variability. The whole climate debate has become very heated. Um, in, in, well, recent years, really. Uh, and um, there is no doubt uh, quite a bit of irritation and anger out there about, about the topic. Um, and we respect that and understand it, but we would like to work, if we could, within a forum where we have the opportunity to think through some issues together. And um, unfortunately, anger and, and um, irritation sometimes get in the way of that topic. So I'd ask you um, to be as gentle with us as you can. Of course, you can say rough things, but... <laughs> But um, it would be good if we could have a productive discussion and dialogue uh, from that. So thank you very much. I think we can, we can begin. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tim. Well, now it's over to you, ladies and gentlemen, for our question and answer session. We do have, as I mentioned, a number of pre-registered questions, and we'll be seeking to answer a mix of those and, of course, a mixture from the floor. Um, if I could please ask, though, that your questions are focused and brief, maybe kept down to around 20 to 30 seconds, uh, so we can get through as many as possible this evening. And we hope also that you will reserve uh, your statements for another forum, as this is strictly an opportunity tonight for questions. We do have a number of roaming microphones this evening. If you'd like to ask a question, simply raise your hand and we'll get one across to you. If you could stand up and maybe give your name, followed by your question, and then please sit straight back down so that the people behind you can see. That would be wonderful. Thank you. All right, let's get underway. Who has a question they'd like to start? My name is Kim Rathold. Look, I had a really interesting report on the radio the other day that differentiated between the public debate and the science. on that. Yeah, well, thank, thanks for that question. I think it's a, a very 
deceptive one, and indeed that is what the case is. Uh, the debate in the scientific community has gone way beyond what you see uh, in the public and particularly in the media. In fact, there's been a very big divergence over the last year or so. Uh, in the scientific community, there is no debate anymore about whether the Earth is warming. Uh, indeed, it is, and there's a lot of good strands of evidence to show that it is warming, uh, and that's not debated anymore. Uh, the second issue is what's causing that warming, uh, and we know that to a very, very high level of confidence, uh, that since the middle of the last century, at least, uh, the majority, main part of that warming uh, is due to the extra greenhouse gases in the atmosphere uh, that have been put up there by human activities. So that debate is over. If you go into the scientific literature, uh, you won't find it. It's been over for uh, a decade or two. Other areas of climate science, risks associated with uh, future change in the climate, there's still a lot of discussion and debate around some of those issues that perhaps we'll get onto those uh, later this evening. Thank you very much, Will. I hope that answered your question, sir. Who has a question now that they'd like to ask one of the commissioners? The lady over there in the green. A oh, gentleman, sorry. My name is Malcolm Roberts, and I've yet to have my sex change operation, but that's OK, Lisa. And I need glasses, so I do apologise. <laughs> that's OK. Uh, just so long as no one says, will you please stand up? Um, will, I take um, issue with your comment about the science has moved on. During the last few years, I've read thousands of pages of scientific literature, and um, clearly, the IPCC has presented us with a lot of corruption, not real world science. So my question to you is very simple. Could you, Professor Flannery failed to answer this in uh, the Gold Coast when I asked him publicly. Could you provide us with one piece of specific real world scientific evidence that shows human production of carbon dioxide has caused global warming? Just one piece, real world. This, this might be an opportunity, Tim, to... Yeah, yeah look, uh, <coughs> again, that's a question that we get asked quite a bit. It might be useful if I show a few graphs here, uh, rather than just talk around in words. I, I think that might help a little bit. So perhaps if we can go, if this works right, I'll be able to do that. Yeah, so I'll, I'll just give you a few graphs to talk about the two questions. The first one, is the climate changing and in what ways? And second of all, what is the reason, which is the question that you just asked me. So let's just start. This is a uh, temperature record from 1880. Uh, going off to 2010. It just fell off the right-hand side of the, the picture there. But you can see the four different major data sets around the world, one Japanese, two American, one UK. They all show the same thing, particularly since the middle of last century, from 1950, 1960. These are ground-based measurements, and, the, and, they have, and they have to be because there were no satellites, of course, at 1900 and so on. That's obvious. But if you put the satellite uh, measurements of the lower atmosphere, uh, which come in the last 30 years or so, you get exactly the same trend. Uh, they lie on top of one another. No, they lie on top of one another. Uh, and, that's clear, and that's clear in the data. No, that's not, that's not at all false. Now, one, one of the interesting things is that some people, like this gentleman here, have challenged this temperature record. There's been a study recently done by physicists at the University of California, Berkeley, under Professor Muller's uh, guidance, and he was a bit of a denier, challenging this, saying uh, that this is dodgy data, that it's been, been doctored and so on. Just two days ago, he released his completely independent study of temperature measurements around the world, uh, checking on the climate scientists, and this is what he shows. His are in black. They lie right on top of what the climate scientists are saying. So there's no doubt, none whatsoever, in the credible scientific community uh, that the Earth is warming. Now, I want to say these are temperatures at the Earth's surface in the atmosphere and in the lower atmosphere by satellite. They all agree they give the same trend. Now, the point, though, that we need to understand is that the most important part of the Earth, in fact, is the ocean. It covers two-thirds of the Earth's surface. The aim of this evening is to begin a conversation. The Commission is here to listen as well as to share some of their knowledge and their experiences. This is your opportunity, though, to ask questions directly to the Commission, and we'll also be taking some of the questions that you asked when you pre-registered for this event. Ladies and gentlemen, it's now my pleasure to introduce Professor Tim Flannery, the Chief Climate Commissioner. Professor Flannery is one of Australia's leading writers on climate change, an internationally acclaimed scientist, explorer and conservationist, and of course, former Australian of the Year in 2007. He's held various academic positions, including professor at the University of Adelaide, 
Director of the South Australian Museum in Adelaide, Principal Research Scientist at the Australian Museum and Visiting Chair in Australian Studies at Harvard University. Would you please welcome Professor Tim Flannery. Well, look, thank you all for being here this evening. Uh, I was here in Ipswich uh, around about two months ago and uh, got an insight into the conditions that many people of this city are facing. I, I don't think there's another community in Australia who are facing the stresses of the recent floods to such an extent as this one. So the fact that you're here tonight, we really, really appreciate. We know that there's many other calls on your time. I I'd like to just take a few minutes to explain what the Commission's about. The uh, Commission arose as a result of a promise at the last election by the Gillard government that they would set up a, a climate commission as an independent body, separate from government, but funded through government. Uh, we, uh, we don't answer to the minister, we're not responsible for government, but we have a very, a very uh, clear brief, and that brief is to engage with the Australian community, to uh, engage in discussions about three areas, really, climate, the science of climate change, um, what's happening around the world in terms of climate policy, what other countries are doing, for example, and how that stacks up against what we're doing, and also the various options that we have uh, to choose from as Australians as we go about dealing with the climate problem. Now, we're, we're, not, uh, we're not going to be commenting on government policy or opposition policy as such, but because we are an apolitical independent body. And could I just say that personally, I value my independence tremendously. I've criticised John Howard and Kevin Rudd on their climate policies. Uh, it's not easy to do, I can tell you, but um, I, I value my independence a lot, so I'm not going to sell that out. And I think that the credibility of us as a commission really does rest uh, in large part on the fact that you can turn to us for credible, unbiased, apolitical advice. So uh, that's the sort of context we want to work within. 